Now in part two, we'll go into a bit more detail, covering regenerative receivers, direct conversion receivers, and simple CW transmitters. One type of regen receiver, and this is called the Armstrong circuit, has three coils. This is the main tuning coil. The variable capacitor is in parallel with the largest coil. There's a smaller coil, which is called the tickler or regeneration coil, and that's usually joined up to a, another capacitor, which is, sets the regeneration, although sometimes there may be a variable resistor here. And finally, the antenna coupling coil. If you want to cover a higher frequency, the easiest way to do it is to remove some turns off the main tuning coil. You should also remove a proportional number of turns from the tickler coil and the antenna coupling coil. With that arrangement, you'll lose coverage down at the bottom end of your original tuning range and gain frequencies higher up. It's not always that simple. As soon as you modify a receiver, make sure you're able to achieve regeneration at all parts of the tuning range. If there are spots where you can't bring the receiver to oscillation, then you may need to make some modifications to the tickler coil, possibly even winding more turns. Conversely, if the thing oscillates at some frequencies and you can't get it to not oscillate, then you might want to reduce the number of turns on the tickler coil. If you wanted to cover lower frequencies, then just add more turns to the coil. Or, if you are lazy and you just want to go a little bit lower in frequency, if you've got a two gang capacitor, then just connect the other section in parallel. And that will allow you to get some more bottom end coverage. Not all regenerative receivers look like the circuit I just drew. Here's another. You've got your main tuning coil still, but there's a tap on the tuning coil. That tap might actually go to the source of effect. That's where the positive feedback gets through and you don't need a separate tickler coil. You do however need an antenna coupling coil as before. Changing the coverage of this is similar in principle to the previous receiver. The only thing is that you should remove a proportional number of turns above the tap as below the tap. In other words, if you were to take 10 turns off the whole lot, then you might take eight turns off the top end and two turns off the bottom end. Although all this is still subject to getting satisfactory regeneration and you might need to change the ratio slightly. Converting a regenerative set to a lower frequency is easy to do and the performance should be at least as good as what you started with when you're trying to convert them to a higher frequency. All sorts of things arise that you might not have experienced at lower frequencies. That's especially if you're using the receiver to tune CW or SSB signals. Tapping on the receiver's case or putting your hand near the tuning capacitor or coil may cause the frequency to vary quite a bit and it might be difficult to make precise tuning adjustments. There may be more frequency drift as a regenerative receiver is essentially a free-running RF oscillator. And gain may be lower. You may not be able to hear weak signals on the higher HF bands. Not all those can be fixed with such a simple circuit, but if you wanted to sort out the gain problem, then you could add an RF amplifier. All these deficiencies are why regenerative receivers are generally used for the AM broadcast band and bottom few shortwave bands. The regenerative receiver that we discussed before had only one stage in the front end that was frequency dependent. A direct conversion receiver has a bit more. Typically, there might be a local oscillator, a front end, a mixer, maybe not an RF amp if it's a simple design, and some audio gain. There may even be some audio filtering in there as well. In a very simple circuit, you might just have a VXO for the local oscillator. That uses a crystal, and that's one of our components we said before was frequency dependent. So you'll need to change that to go to another band or even frequency in the case of this crystal. The other frequency dependent part of a direct conversion receiver is the front end. All but the crudest designs will have at least one tuned circuit and ideally two. 
The resonant frequency of it needs to be changed to that of the incoming signal to get reasonable sensitivity. In a direct conversion receiver, most of the gain is in the audio part of the receiver. That's fine for 3.5 or 7 MHz. But as you go up in HF frequency, the amount of band noise declines and the amount of gain you want in the receiver increases. So you may need to add an RF preamp for 14 meg and up. By the way, a good test of any receiver is whether it receives band noise. If it does, then it's sensitive enough. Now on to transmitters. We'll start off with a very simple CW transmitter. A crystal oscillator. You might want to have some frequency agility, make it a VXO. A buffer stage. You may have some form of tuned circuit. A power amplifier stage. And a low pass filter and your antenna. Now, where are the frequency determining elements of this circuit? First of all, the crystal oscillator. You'll definitely need to change that, or more precisely, the crystal used if you're going to go to another band. If the circuit has a VXO, especially if it's got a coil in as well, then that will need some attention to get an appropriate frequency shift. If the coil is too much, then the frequency excursion will be so high it becomes unstable. And if the coil is too small, then you won't get much shift at all. So, having sorted out the VXO, we have a buffer, and some buffer outputs are untuned. It might be broadband circuitry, it might just be a coupling capacitor. But this particular one has a narrow tuned circuit. We'll need to change its resonant frequency. You double the inductance and double the capacitance to go to half the frequency, or you halve the inductance and halve the capacitance to go to double the frequency. There's the power amplifier. There may be a output tank in here. It may be broadband, it may not be. Again, look at the circuit. And finally, our low pass filter. Definitely need to change that. As we mentioned before that the gain of transistors drops as you go up in frequency. If you're modifying this to from 7 meg to 14 meg, you might actually need to adjust some of the stages, change some of the component values, and squeeze a bit more gain out of some of these amplifier stages. Or more radically, you might even have to add extra stages. That might be the case if you're going to a greatly higher frequency, i.e. 7 to 21 or 28 meg. Another thing, of course, is that crystals are normally available in fundamental type frequencies up to 20 or 25 megahertz. And if you're going to say 28 or 50 megahertz, then you might need to do something different here. You may need to build an overtone oscillator circuit. Or you could have a lower frequency crystal and make one of these stages a frequency multiplier and then You'll need some more tuned circuits here though to ensure the output is clean and that becomes a whole new project and quite different from the circuit that you started with. What about going down in frequency? Well, a fairly common circuit you might see in a QRP transmitter circuit, especially a very simple one. You might have a tuned circuit. These are stages, either the buffer stage or an RF amplifier stage. Let's say this is your final transistor although it could also be the driver you might have a resistor in here now you may have more gain than is required the transistor might put out more than its rated power it may get very hot it may have oscillations on other frequencies so you need to tame it one thing you can do is to drop the value of this resistor. It might start off at 33 ohm, but you could substitute 27 or 22 ohm. There's a lot of cut and try when you're modifying things to different bands. Even if you were to build many circuits for their intended bands, you might need to still make some adjustments, and it's doubly so if you're also going to be converting it to other bands up or down. Another thing you can do to tame the transistor is to add a ferrite bead or low value resistor on its base lead. And of course, we probably need some decoupling here. Uh, you probably need a, a few capacitors here. You might have a 
100 nanofarad. You might also have a higher value, an electrolytic, let's say 470 microfarad, something like that. You might need to add some RF chokes to isolate the RF because RF can circulate from various stages around the driver and power amplifier. There's all these things you might need to do to tame the amplifier and that's most likely if you are converting a higher frequency design with transistors, maybe even VHF transistors, to operate on lower frequencies where the gain will be a lot more. That was part two. Keep watching for part three where we'll dissect a QRP transceiver project and look at all the components that would need to be changed to get it to operate on another band.